So let's discuss what that intervention should be. There are many designs, many approaches to this. There's no one right answer. There are static, dynamic, and suspension designs. So let's do a little bit of an informal comparison. A static wrist orthosis may be of value to some patients. It's particularly useful in the younger patient who is unable to manage any other type of orthotic very well, and it may also be appropriate in those patients who have difficulty understanding and following through with instructions. It may be that a static orthosis is useful for the patient to wear part of the time, or he or she may wish to sleep in it. The challenge is, however, that a static orthosis does not recreate the ideal tenodesis pattern. And therefore, if the nerve is returning, the re-innervated muscles are not able to be used. If we look at these illustrations of dynamic orthoses, we see that there's a huge variety that have been de devised over many years. Some of these are still available commercially. However, if you look at each of these illustrations, you will see that there's some dynamic component and therefore, during active finger flexion, what invariably happens is the patient pulls against the orthosis and goes into flexion. In other words, dynamic support of the wrist is rarely, if ever, strong enough support to allow finger flexion simultaneously to wrist extension. For that reason, I personally do not favor these designs. These designs, which are a bit older, are actually extending the interphalangeal joints which if you understand radial palsy you know is unnecessary. So many times an approach to radial palsy can be, if you will, a bit of an overkill approach. In my view the simplest is always the best. And even with this overdramatic design we still have the same problem that flexion occurs against the dynamic force. Therefore, if you are endeavoring to apply dynamic orthosis to a patient with radial palsy, be sure and observe the pattern of finger flexion and that during finger flexion, the wrist is stabilized in at least slight extension. If this is the pattern of flexion, then I would offer you that the orthosis is not effective. You do not want to see concurrent wrist and finger flexion. Now there are innumerable commercial devices available on the market, some of which are more streamlined than others and some of which may assist in function more than others. As an educator during this presentation, I feel that my focus should be on assisting you in developing skills to determine what is appropriate for a patient. So I will leave it to you to determine which of the commercially available orthoses may or may not be of value. There are some lower profile uh, devices that have been developed specifically for radial palsy. In this case is a, both a short and a long device that, ha that uh, has stays in the fingers which uh, provide support for extension. Benick is a company that also has created semi-dynamic orthoses. But in my view, the majority of the commercially available orthoses unfortunately allow resisted flexion rather than reestablishing this ideal tenodesis pattern. So I would like to go back to a relatively old design that appears to be dynamic, but in reality what we're looking at is we're looking at static components for the loops that go to the fingers and if there is a thumb component, 
perhaps an elastic loop to that. I'm calling this a suspension design, and I'll explain that momentarily. But we want to be very clear that the suspension is not an elastic or dynamic component. We said earlier that the ideal would be to reestablish this relational motion in the hand with our intervention with a radial palsy patient. If an orthosis is used that has static lines and suspends the proximal phalanges such that when extended the wrist cannot drop below neutral. The intrinsic muscles will extend the interphalangeal joints and the weight of the hand is extending the metacarpal phalangeal joints. So here is extension, flexion, extension, flexion, extension. Perhaps it's helpful to think about this suspension system as two children swinging on a swing. The top bar of the swing is the outrigger bar on the orthosis and each child is sitting in a finger sling. This child represents finger extension where during finger extension the swing swings distally to accommodate the extension. The other child represents finger flexion with the proximal phalanx pulling the sling proximally and at a different angle during finger flexion. So all we're trying to do with the radial nerve orthosis design is to create a swing effect for the proximal phalanx. This is done by using a suspension design that has a proximal forearm base, an outrigger, and finger loops. The finger loops can be attached directly to the outrigger bar, such as in this example, and you can see that the angle of the finger loops changes based on flexion or extension of the fingers. This is a design that was originated by Granger and there is an article in your references of the original description of the Granger orthosis. Now there are other types of suspension devices. We're going to look at a commercial component that's been added to a base in order to support the hand in a tenodesis pattern. Compare this to the previous YouTube clip when the patient was very awkward and had some difficulty picking up the small objects. You can see that the patient now has increased speed compared to previously and does not struggle with either picking up or releasing the objects. The wrist is extended It's possible to make this orthosis even more streamlined by removing the molded proximal dorsal forearm piece and creating a three-point pressure design. In this case, leather has been used to make it both more comfortable for the patient as well as somewhat more cosmetic. The only disadvantage with this design is the finger loops when attached directly to the outrigger cannot be easily replaced if for some reason one of them does need to be replaced because of long-term use. Perhaps the easier way to go about the suspension is to use some kind of an outrigger, either one that you make or one that is readily available, to provide the static lines and recreate the tenodesis, rather than putting the finger loops directly on the wire. It is possible and it would work very well, but they cannot easily be replaced. Perhaps you're wondering about 
the use of a radial palsy orthosis and an outrigger for the thumb which if you noticed is illustrated in most of the commercial uh, orthotics that are available. You can see here all of these have a thumb outrigger. If we look at the primary thumb extensor, you'll notice that it traverses dorsally across the dorsum of the wrist and therefore we would assume that wrist motion has a significant effect on the tension of the extensor pollicis longus. In a cross section, we see that the extensor pollicis longus sits in the third dorsal compartment. Therefore, if the orthosis is supporting the wrist in extension, in other words, never allowing it to go into any flexion beyond a neutral position, tension is already removed from this extensor and functional use of the thumb becomes somewhat easier. If however you feel that it is useful to add an outrigger it would be important that the outrigger have an elastic component because the angle of movement of the thumb is at a right angle to the movement of the wrist in flexion and extension. So the static line would no longer be appropriate. But in my view this radial outrigger often is more cumbersome than it is useful. It makes it more difficult for example to get the hand in and out of a coat in the winter time. It makes it more difficult to do things that are self-care activities because the radially based outrigger may protrude and it may hit you in the face for example if you're taking off your glasses or putting them on. In this case it's much too long. It doesn't need to be at the tip of the thumb. Extension of the interphalangeal joint of the thumb is not only accomplished by the extensor pollicis longus but also by other intrinsic muscles in the thumb and there's often also a contribution by the extensor pollicis brevis. So the outrigger can be shorter than this and more proximal over the proximal phalanx. I personally prefer to eliminate all outriggers and if needed, which we'll discuss momentarily, I take a small piece of thermoplastic material and devise a very small orthosis to support the metacarpal phalangeal joint out of a flexed posture. How do I decide whether to use this or not? If you look at the left image and you look at the fingers going down into flexion without an outrigger, you see that the thumb is sitting under the index finger and during finger flexion the thumb is actually in the way because the patient has relatively significant metacarpal phalangeal joint flexion naturally with the small orthosis in place, now during finger flexion the thumb is not in the way. The thumb can be brought into greater flexion. There's nothing impeding flexion. The orthosis, the small orthosis applied does not impede it. Further extension at the CMC joint is not possible because the muscles which normally do that are no longer innervated but if this patient wants to reach out for a large object the fingers will extend and the patient has the ability to push the thumb against the object to bring it into greater extension and then use the functional flexion which is readily available. 